And is your day going fine so far? Fine so far. I've done shopping and uh, interviews. It's like shopping and interviews. That's an impressive background. Did you have that from day one of becoming a Zoom person? Yes, it makes me look learned. Uh, <laughs> or, uh, somewhere in Hogwarts. I wouldn't actually know the answer to this. Are you a big reader? I am. And what has been odd in this pandemic, I thought, oh, I'm just going to, I just finished like my first, I, I, I picked up a book like five days ago and, and finished it. And I, I thought I'd be through all of this. Uh, not even close. <laughs> not even close. Do you read primarily memoirs or fiction? It depends. I, I go all over the place. Uh, I get into a biography phase. Then I had to write, um, I was working on a, a project, uh, a film noir project. So I was reading all detective and mysteries. That was for a year. Now I'm, uh, oh, I guess I'm still in that. Uh, Linwood Barclay has become uh, someone I've, I'm working through his oeuvre. Uh, Stephen oh. King, uh, always. And who else? Oh, uh, Michael Connolly, who writes the Bosch series. Right. So I guess I'm still in that area right now. But uh, every once in a while, um, something will, will come up and I'll, I'll, I'll read that. I'm not a snob. <laughs> well, before I uh, get to asking about boys and girls, you're one of those people that everybody recognizes, or at least in my world, everyone recognizes. But I could never say who Colin Mockery's favorite band is, what his favorite movie is. And I can imagine the influences are all over the place. Hence, you know, your success as an improviser. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, as an improviser, you, I mean, you soak everything that's, you know, ever made you laugh or made you uh, think or that you've enjoyed. There's a this theory that when um, you're cl close to death or in a bad situation and your life flashes before your eyes, it's your brain downloading every bit of information you've ever had in your life to see if there's something that will help you get out of the situation. And that's what improvising is like. Your mind just goes through everything you've ever experienced and gone through. You open your mouth and something comes out. Exactly. So the new movie, even though it's not the latest project you've worked on, according to your IMDb page, oh, really? is Boys and Girls. <laughs> when did you actually film it? Because it says 2019 on the IMDb page. And then I think it says it's 2020 on your Wikipedia, like the press release. And sometimes movies are made, you know, a year or two before they come out. Yeah. I'm going to say 2018 was when, yeah, I think that's when we um, filmed it and then they'd be working editing. And then of course, everything got sort of, I don't know if you read the papers, but there's <laughs> been stuff happening. It's really thrown us for a loop. I could imagine. Were you on set the whole time? I was there for uh, three days. Uh, so it was in and, and out. It was, uh, I mean, it was lovely. Uh, you know, uh, I've known Kevin McDonald for a long time, so right. and I knew he was going to be on the shoot, so I knew that was going to be fun. And then meeting these young people who, uh, you know, obviously are there to replace me once I go. Um, it was nice working with them. And, and Mike was a, a fun director and was very um, open to us having fun with the script. I mean, we would do this, our first take, it would be a script take, and then he would say, all right, have fun, do whatever you want, um, which you don't always get. And which, I mean, I never improvise on set unless I'm asked to. I'm, I'm always, you know, my job is to make sure the writer's words are used and his point of view comes out. So it was nice to have that sort of fun. That's got to be a good ego kind of thing that when you get the Bruce Willis deal, when it's like, yeah, you just show up for three days and we'll cater it around you because you're such a big star. So, yeah, we, uh, yeah, Bruce and I have, uh, met, we've talked about this, how similar we are. <laughs> um, yeah. I yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually, I, I, don't, I don't have that many scenes in the uh, a movie. And since it was, um, we had the one location, it was pretty easy just to schedule everything. So uh, I would say in the last five years, every movie I've worked on has been like that, where I've come in, I've done everything in three days, and then they send me away. <laughs> I try not to, you know, see something in that, that maybe <laughs> that's as long as they can take me. No. Well, people who dig into the research on you know that you had to move around a lot as a kid. Mm -hmm. So I don't assume that you went to a lot of summer camp in your upbringing? 
No, never went to a summer camp. Um, my, my daughter uh, did, and I, I'm jealous because uh, I see <laughs> the relationship she ha still has with campers she went to. She became a counselor. And right. this particular camp she went to was a really, um, it was a, a really lovely camp where they, they ha had like a, 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 a tree that everybody would stand around and then if there was something that was bothering you or you were homesick, you would go up to the tree and you'd talk and then everybody would hug you. And it was, it was just a lovely, lovely camp. And I thought, I feel like I missed out on something big because watching meatballs isn't actually the same as being in a summer camp. <laughs> was the entire thing filmed at the camp? It was. They, uh, they lucked out in that if you're shooting a, a, a summer camp movie, mm -hmm. you need a camp in the summer. And that's usually when camps are actually busy. <laughs> so yeah. they actually found this one that they were um, about to renovate. So for the, they were going to start renovations in July. July. So that meant all of June um, they had for the film. So it, w it was a lucky little accident. I don't know if it's practically a profanity to say the words wet, hot American summer when you're talking to another person in a camp movie per se. But I remember reading and hearing that wet, hot American summer, it rained the whole time that they filmed that movie. It was just a stroke of bad luck. I assume the weather was cooperative when you made this movie. It was quite, from what I can remember, it was, I think there was one day where they feared there was going to be rain, which I always love. It's like, so it can't rain in the movie, but I'm guessing there's other <laughs> considerations um but yeah the, the weather was uh was quite good and i always wonder uh, is dirty dancing a camp movie i think it is i watched that netflix documentary that they did about how we think of it as this huge movie and how at the time it was kind of a failure that no one expected anything from and that's the movie uh, music they used because they had no budget and etc but they filmed it at a different resort than they presented it at i think it's a camp movie to you yeah, and that was the first, uh, my first date with my wife was that movie. That's how much I loved her. I went to that movie. <laughs> I interviewed the, the two guys a couple days ago who wrote I've Had the Time of My Life and Hungry Eyes. And those songs to me are unlike anything else in their catalogs. I guess they got into a weird mindset to be able to write something so romantic. I guess so. I, and, you know, it helps when cash is being wave at you you go no i can do this hungry eyes wait a minute <laughs> it's coming to me exactly so speaking of that what music are you into as i said before i have no idea what you're into and you can name the most obscure canadian bands that's fine with me <laughs> chilliwack <laughs> i know chilliwack they're on my yacht rock playlist yeah. when i was um okay when i was uh growing up in vancouver uh chilliwack and there was a group called doug and the slugs yeah were, yeah, sort of the precursor to uh, almost uh, bare naked ladies. I love their music, but they also had a sense of humor. Um, and of course, you know, like the Beatles, um, the Rolling Stones. You've heard of those guys. A couple times. Yeah. I mean, there are times where I have, I remember I, during the Wings Day where it was like, yeah, Paul McCartney was in another band before Wings. They're, you should check them out. They had some good stuff. Um, and then, well, right now, my, our constants in the house are the Rat Pack, uh, Sinatra and Dean Martin. My wife is more a, a eclectic. Uh, she plays classical music uh, in the morning. She's a big Zeppelin fan. She actually, she saw the Beatles in concert. She was at Woodstock. So she, wow. uh, yeah, she ran away to Woodstock. <laughs> she was 14. She ran away and got caught and didn't see anything. And I thought, how did, how could you get caught in, there were thousands of people. Yeah. She said, I stuck out. <laughs> now I know. I like to, to ask people who are immersed in the Canadian scene. Of course, you've had all the success in the States and elsewhere, but I find out about bands like Street Heart, who never made it here that were a big deal in Canada. And I found out about all these great bands that we have been deprived of because we didn't have much music, except if you had extensive cable programming. Yeah, well, uh, for a long time, we were deprived of Canadian uh, bands because um, it wasn't until hmm, the 70s that they basically forced 
radio stations to play Canadian bands. Right. Uh, just to get that content out there. And everyone at that point, people said, oh, well, this is going to because that's the kind of country we are. <laughs> well, this is going to suck. We have to listen to our own music. And then these artists became known worldwide and respected. And it, it ultimately ended up being a great thing. Uh, and I wish they would kind of do it with our, our movies and television. You know, oh. things like Schitt's Creek, uh, Kim's Convenience are reaching. But I yeah. Think we know. yeah, Letter Kenny is starting to make a big impact over yeah. here as well. Oh, and there's a new uh, Transplant, which has become a big hit in, uh, in the States. Yeah, so... But, but I think uh, the genius thing about what you just mentioned about how Canadian, a certain percentage of Canadian music had to be played on Canadian airwaves. So certain American arts like Bon Jovi and Metallica were kind of figuring out, well, if we record in Vancouver with Bob Rock, then it's a Canadian album. Therefore, it has to be played. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. brilliant. And as I mentioned before, boys and girls, not the only thing on your IMDb page that's coming up. I see ankle biters and maybe there's a tree are those both correct titles oh geez i don't think those were the titles when i started maybe there'll be a tree i think i did that like five years ago ankle biters was maybe two or three and i have to say when i think of what the story was that title is very wrong for it <laughs> okay <laughs> well well on a much much brighter note i admire how you and Brad have taken things online. You didn't just go, well, there's no touring, we're over. You took it to Zoom. You're yeah. suffering through Zoom with me. You're suffering through Zoom with that. And I do see that you do have January 2021 tour dates that are still booked. We'll see what happens with that in April and May and all that. But what was your impetus to kind of realize that you could take everything to Zoom with your improv? Uh, well, we realized fairly soon that we were not going to be going back to theaters uh, in the immediate future. I mean, over the last 18 years, my life has been airplanes and theaters. Mm. So I thought, there's a change coming. And uh, we sort of talked, and we have a great technical team, and they sent us green screens and everything, and we tried to figure out how to do our show. And uh, we had a couple of sort of preview shows with friends and family, God bless them. Yeah. Uh, and we, from those shows, we realized this sucks. <laughs> we realized we couldn't transfer our stage show to uh, Zoom because the screen, first of all, shrinks everybody's attention span. <laughs> and, uh, you know, on stage, we can do 20 minute scenes and we still keep the audience involved. Yeah. This, uh, no, so we decided, okay, let's do more make it more like an improvised sketch show where it's all improvised, but everything shorter and faster. And um, the biggest thing was getting around, not being a slave to the technology, having the technology be sort of like a third improviser rather than our boss. And we could yeah. just have fun. And that took a couple of shows and now it's like, oh, it's like sort of second nature. And response has been great. I mean, it's weird not hearing laughter during a, a show, which Brad is totally used to. <laughs> I, I knew that was coming. <laughs> but um, it, it, it is yeah. odd having to have that extra, okay, this is, uh, I'm pretty sure this is funny. I'm just going to go with it. Let's hope. And in terms of live entertainment, the shows with Brad are not the only live performances you do. There's the hypnosis shows, which is definitely innovative. There's the shows that you do with your wife. Real question here. Is there a different preparation for you mentally between all those live performances? Yes, you've been doing this forever in a good way, but is it kind of like, okay, I'm with my wife, I can't do this, this, and this, or is it all the same at this point? There is, yes, there's differences in every, um, with, with Brad, you know, we've been touring for 18 years. We do sort of what we call a live, uh, a live version of Who's Line without the tall guy and the black guy. So it's a lot of the games from Who's Line. Uh, that we sort of um, yeah. manipulated some of them to make it easier for the two of us. With Deb, it's more a, an improv show. Uh, we call it our um, one couple uh, show. So a lot of it is more, uh, and with the sexual tension is much more than it is with Brad. <laughs> but yeah. Deb doesn't feel at, at as ease with games. She's uh, characters and, um, more narrative scenes, which is great. 
the hypnotist is just me panicking for a, an hour working with people I've just met who are in a hypnotic state yeah so that one um, in the other two shows I can relax a little bit because I'm working with people I trust and who are experienced improvisers with the hypnosis I'm more um, keeping my eye out for trouble spots and what's going to happen and I have to say the hypnotized improvisers every show we find a star someone who is where I'm happy just to follow and support them but it's a it's I'm, I'm exhausted after that show I could imagine uh, and further into my deep deep research of you I read that on whose line that the hoedown section was always the troubling tough nerve-wracking part at this point in your life, is that now easier, even if you don't sing per se, to just come up with musically oriented comedy on the spot? No, it's, it, it's horrific. It's, it's never, <laughs> it, it will never be, uh, like all of us hate it. We, we despise it. First of all, it's not a musical style. Hoedown is not a musical style. But there's the thing of, I was usually third. So there's the first person who immediately is under the spot. They have to come up with a funny rhyme. And then the second person, um, same thing. By the time it gets to me, I have to have two or three rhymes just in case one of those bastards take mine. And it happens all the time. And poor Ryan's at the end, and he's just, I can just hear him whispering, don't say it. <laughs> and yours with whatever. And I'm going, look, I'm, I'm out to save my ass. I'll say whatever I want. So um, it's at no point is it a, oh yeah, this will, this will be fine. We've, we've done 30 years of hoedowns. <laughs> it's gonna be so easy. It never is. I've encountered a lot of musicians who can only improvise when it comes to singing and they have the instrument in their hand and they can't do what you do. So it might be person to person on that end. Okay, it might be. Well. My closing question, because you've been so generous with your time, and yes, we're going to see boys and girls with you, the great Kevin McDonald, et cetera, is Colin, any last words for the kids? Like kids in the hall or just kids? <laughs> <laughs> well, the regular kids. Uh, kids in the hall. Uh, great they're, they're getting a reboot. But. Well done. Um, for all the kids, yeah, go see this movie. You know what? Um, here's the thing. Um, I think we found throughout the last year how important uh, humor is, how important entertainment and arts are. So please um, get involved with the arts, support the arts, get your parents and other people to uh, support it because it, it truly is an essential service and is much needed today. And also uh, be kind to everyone. Uh, you know, it, it seems, oh, okay, here's <laughs> old man mockery. It seems that uh, in the last uh, decade or so, empathy is starting to uh, shrink and we don't put ourselves in other people's shoes as much as we should. And uh, we should because not everyone can be as privileged as us or not everyone can have uh, a stable home life or whatever as we. So if somebody's acting out or going through a bad time, try to find out why try to imagine what it would be like to be in that situation and always reach out. Hey, Darren, how you doing? Great, and yourself there, Pierre? Doing well, doing well, can't complain. Of the thousands of interviews that I've done, I've never spoken to anyone who has a Sadish in their last name before. Did I say that correctly? Sadeli. Uh, you see, the things I don't know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> great to be speaking with you. Uh, and Amazon Prime is who connected us, so I got to ask outright. December 26 has some great mm -hmm. NFL games on it. Besides that, what do you like to watch on Amazon Prime? I love to watch a lot of Amazon originals, a lot of documentaries on Amazon Prime Video. Definitely um, The Boys is one of my favorites. Uh, looking forward to Sylvie's Love coming out, a uh, former NFL player, um, Namdi. Ashmagu is uh, starring in it with his um, film career. Uh, definitely looking forward to it. And a lot of uh, all or nothing Amazon originals from the sports teams around the, around the world, actually, um, are on Prime Video. So definitely those things that I like to watch, as well as now they're showing football on Christmas Day and on um, the day after Christmas with my former, former team. Yeah, the 25th and the 26th both have great football games on there. 
This part I don't know. Is there anything different about NFL's presentation on Amazon Prime? I, I assume the sound is great, the picture's great, but anything else to it? Um, no, probably uh, not too many different because uh, it's probably all through the NFL, but it's just being broadcasted on um, Prime Video where you know families can watch it as well as watch different um, originals and documentaries uh, off of Amazon. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. It's just uh, growing up when I was a hockey fan, I remember I was excited mm -hmm. when Fox got hockey in the mid-90s, and then they put some kind of a laser blue chip on the puck, and we were all watching and going, what? what? What is going on here? So I didn't know if Amazon said, well, we're going to put a laser chip in the football. <laughs> on the football. <laughs> I remember that. It did help keep up with the hockey puck. I remember that. <laughs> exactly. And Amazon also has music to it, a great music subscription mm -hmm. service. Has that been something that you've had the chance to try out? I know you're a big Wyclef fan. Not sure who else you listen to. <laughs> yeah, definitely listen to Amazon Music. Uh, definitely, I love it. And, and the Prime Video, too. They're definitely opening up their uh, platforms to different things, but definitely more of a Prime Video guy than, uh, than the Amazon Music. Because nowadays, <laughs> music just all over the place. Yeah, and something that everyone realizes about you is you were not just a one athlete star. You also excelled the track and soccer before you made it to the NFL. And Amazon has a lot of great soccer content. Do you keep up with soccer much? Mm -hmm. these I I do. I have been. Um, Amazon does have um, the original All or Nothing on Tottenham, and I actually last year went to a Tottenham soccer game, and it had a new stadium, and it was exciting. And and the way they support. Uh, soccer in london is definitely a lot stronger than we support american football here but i'm um, definitely follow up with soccer and i did play soccer first growing up uh and it was definitely uh pretty cool to to see it on um prime video and, and to get the behind the scenes to actually see it in person too as well when i went to the game so it's definitely uh all plays into the uh in the circle and you're a lifer there in florida you've been very loyal to west oh, yes. Beach. <laughs> Who's your MS? Uh, who's your MLS team of the moment? Because I know that they're putting the new stadium, or have put the new stadium into Miami. Mm -hmm. right there. I used to love the Miami Fusion. I used to go to the Miami Fusion games now, but now they have the Miami FC um, football team. But I've always been a big fan of um, Josie Altidore, but he plays for Toronto. Um, also, the Atlanta team when they came up, uh, they were doing very well um, their first couple of years. Uh, but definitely, definitely love you know MLS. Uh, but my favorite team would be would have been the Miami Fusion, now Toronto because Josie. Uh, but those those are my squad that I kind of try to stay on top of and see how their season's been going or how it went. Now, much to your credit, you're not just an NFL veteran who had an amazing career. You've got a great charitable foundation. You got a great sock company. You got this great Amazon work. But is there an accomplishment that you're most proud of at this point in time? Uh, I'm just proud to, to to have played in the NFL. I'm proud to have helped a lot of families, um, you know, throughout my years in the NFL, and just you know to be happy to 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 try to lead my family, you know, uh, on what can be done so I can pass it on so that they can know that they can accomplish their goals and dreams. Because you know, when you see somebody doing it, you know, it, it inspires you to do it, and that's why I want to give them the inspiration to to do better, to want more, and, and to want to do better. And that, that's the thing that I try to be the most proud of. I'm trying to set a good example. And you mentioned before one of your buddies from the NFL acting on an upcoming Amazon series. Do you have acting yeah. in your future? <laughs> acting is, uh, is, is pretty hard. Uh, I will try it, but I'm, you know, I'm not, not eager to do it. But I can uh, definitely look, 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 look into it because it, it, it's something unique. I love learning. I love doing different things. And, and Sylvie loved it. shooting a whole movie is a lot harder than shooting commercials. So not be, I give them a lot of credit for, for you know, starting the movie and, um, you know, seeing how that plays out. Definitely looking forward to watching that too. And something I like to ask everybody who's ever retired from the NFL, have you ever tried DDP Yoga, Diamond Dallas Page's yoga program? <laughs> I've never heard of it. Uh, can you tell me more about it? Oh, it's something that I knew that every retired NFL player gets a subscription to. Not not the point. The point is I'm talking to a great, great NFL icon. And Speed Aid compression is your stock line. Do you know, do players in the NFL wear Speed Aid? Oh, definitely. Oh, man. Players in the NFL, there's at least 85% of players in the NFL that wear compression socks 
every day. We all have all kinds of injuries from calf to, you know, blood flow to everything. So compression socks is definitely worn every day by NFL players. I'm trying to, you know, convince people that because I've worn them actually in games where, you know, you're coming off a long flight, coming off of injuries, your pre-existing injuries. But yes, NFL players wear compression socks every day. We might not promote it, but we do. And and I've been definitely, definitely one of the players that have worn it ever since I got in the league. And that was 11, 12, 13 years ago, probably. Fantastic. Well, two quick questions and then you're free. And the first one is, this one might take a second of thought here. Before the pandemic, All what right. was the last concert that you saw live? What month did the pandemic happen? It was like March. March. Yeah. Uh, the last concert. I actually went to the weekend concert. I was living out in California. Um, the weekend, he does a lot of shows, um, you know, up and down um, California. But I went to the weekend concert. But I think that was probably the last one that I could remember. I love the weekend, though. So he's, uh, he's a good artist. <laughs> Amen to that. And the closer, Pierre, any mm -hmm. last words for the kids? Um, stay healthy, keep learning, uh, listen to your parents. <laughs> Outro cast. And then my closer for you is any last words for the kids? <laughs> for the kids? Yeah. Oh, man. Well, what, what could it be for the kids? The ki I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what's happening out there. I don't know. I don't know what the music is now. I don't know what the... Yeah, you're asking the wrong person, I'm afraid. Well, let me tell you why I'm not asking the wrong person. If I were one of those weird kids in high school, which I might have been, who was like, yeah. I want to work in the entertainment business. I want to have a career around the performing arts. Yeah. And then I see Jules Shear and I go, wait, that guy has been earning his living, or at least most of his living, related to performing. Yeah, how's he doing that? How, how does that guy... <laughs> Yeah, I understand. Well, he did it. So, I mean, you have to look at that as, as, as a successful person, a person that goes, I'm going to express myself and create stuff out of thin air for a living. Hmm. That's, that's true. Okay. Yeah. So, go ahead. So, do you have any advice on what a person who's trying to think, hey, how can I do what that guy is doing or something similar, how they actually can start doing that? <laughs> Oh, well, you're talking about somebody writing songs, right? Presumably writing songs and not being the cover band person. Yeah. Well, that's always going to be more difficult, right? Right. Uh, yeah. I, just, just write them. Just, it's gonna, just gotta, you just gotta sit down and write what you feel like writing. And if you, if you write what you feel like writing and that's all you do, that's really good. I mean, I think that's really perfect. I don't know. I, maybe I'm wrong, but I think writing, just just doing what doing what you want to do, that's it. Uh, I don't know. I don't know any other way of doing it. This is really just the way I've I've just done it, you know. Uh, and I wasn't doing it thinking, oh, one day I'm going to tell people how to do this, you know. No, I wasn't doing that. Outro cast.